everything. Emergent stuff for OBGYN, emergent stuff for cardio, emergent stuff for poem, and the emergent stuff for um, renal. Like, so it can be, you know, overwhelming and stressful, of course, but yes. Hello, hi, happy Monday. Hey, everyone, welcome to eShadowing. Hi, hello, I see everyone in the chat. Um, so I'm Rodalyn. I usually host eShadowing um, as we have a guest, but today we don't have a guest. Um, so I always have something back up, a backup and something ready prepared to um, present to you guys. So either way, I'm going to have a case study. So uh, usually when that happens, I do like a Q&A type of session uh, where I answer questions, any and all PA related questions and then do the case study. So half of it is going to be questions and the other half is going to be case studies and answering any questions related to the case study. So um, it's actually November and it's been like about a year that I've been doing e-shadowing and I know that a lot of you guys are probably new as a lot of the students that were initially um, attending e-shadowing got into PA school so if you're new like if you recently started watching e-shadowing let me know so I can kind of get an idea or feel for like who's like kind of new I'm sure a lot of you are and who doesn't know too much about how like about e-shadowing and you know or hasn't seen me seen me present because we've had guests the past few weeks I believe um we had a guest last week I, I don't know if I presented before the week before if we had a guest but we're gonna have a guest next week as well okay so I see some new okay yeah so Oh, wow, a lot of you guys are new. Great. <laughs> I see. I'm new. I'm new. I'm new. Okay. So <laughs> I am Rodalyn for all of you that are new. I'm a physician assistant. Um, I've been a PA for about five years, uh, a little over five years, August 2016. I graduated from PA school. I went to Nova Southeastern University in Florida. I'm from Florida, but uh, I'm based in Atlanta. I moved to Atlanta for work, and now I do some... I do some travel work and I do a little bit of everything. I'm just kidding. I do travel work and uh, when I can, when I kind of want to. And then I also work in the urgent care. Um, when I do travel work, it's the ER. Um, so yeah, and so glad to have you guys. I am very down to earth and fun and energetic and goofy. So a lot of times I'll make jokes and I make everything fun. Okay, so I'll start by answering questions. The first question I see is, how did you like NOVA? I'm interested in applying. So NOVA has, um, when I applied, NOVA was had like the um, largest PA program as far as like students and the most campuses. Um, so there's four NOVA programs uh, in Florida. NOVA's located in Florida. They're all throughout Florida, like North Florida, Jacksonville, uh, Central Florida, Orlando, West Florida, Fort Myers, that's the one I went to. And South Florida is the actual regular campus. Uh, so I went to the one in Fort Myers and I liked it. It was fine. You know, I feel like it did the job as far as getting me into PA school. They have a good pants pass rate. They're accredited. You know, Nova's a well-known school, especially in Florida. Um, so I feel like it did it did the job. It did what it needed to do as far as making me a PA. A lot of what you learn, um, school just kind of scratches the surface as far as your career and the PA profession and kind of make sure you have the basics down of uh, what you're going to learn and just your comfort level and getting comfortable is going to just be from experience so and school's not going to teach you that i have an interview at drexel did you an interview or apply there no i did not inter um, apply at drexel i don't remember all the schools i applied to i can name some of them but you know drexel wasn't one of them um was it hard to get a job as a new pa graduate yes to me it was hard i graduated in august i took the pants like a week after graduation i graduated like August 21st and I took the pants like 10 days later or like August 31st and then I found out that I passed the pants a week later September 7th and then I didn't get a job until like October 16th <laughs> I'm very good with dates <laughs> as you can see like the exact date yeah I didn't get a job till like October 16th and it wasn't even my ideal job I wanted to like either be in the ER or urgent care it was an urgent care job but it was like a really new urgent care it wasn't like really preparing me to be an urgent care PA I I felt like so it took me about a, I mean I guess a month is not bad but I had to like it, I didn't even
even stay in that job for too long. I probably did that job for like two months and then kind of shut down. And then I had to find a kind of another job. And I did some addic- addiction medicine at the same time. Well, I didn't get the ER job that I wanted until my second year as a PA. I got hired right after the hurricane, around the hurricane time, I think like September 2017. That's when I got the job offer for an ER job in Georgia. It wasn't in Atlanta quite yet. It was like middle Georgia. So I got the ER job in Georgia and I didn't start until uh, February. So no, I got the job in October. I got the job in October. It took like three, four months to start due to credentialing. So I started February, 2018, my first ER job. So you go, the thing is, you know, to be where you want to be as far as like a specialty and your ideal job, you may have to kind of, you know, do things that you may not want to do initially, but it's really just to get that experience. Oh goodness. You guys have so many questions. Great. <laughs> How is your work in the ER? Um, the ER is tough, I would say. Um, there's a lot to learn and do. Uh, it's just a specific flow. And now that I like kind of travel or I've done a few travel gigs, like I see the how like every ER has like their dynamics and their flow and culture and everything. And it's just, I mean, it's different, but it's kind of the same. It's tough because, you know, you, you have to know so much about everything. Yeah, you have to know a lot about everything as a opposed to other specialties where you kind of have to just know about that one specialty like cardio you really just know cardio you can probably know a little bit about you know other things but here you got to know emergent stuff for everything emergent stuff for OBGYN emergent stuff for cardio emergent stuff for poem and the emergent stuff for um reno like so it can be you know overwhelming and stressful of course but yes and if you're new I have a lot of past videos on YouTube where I really go in debt about the ER and everything and um um, to give you guys a lot of information so and I've also interviewed um, or not interviewed but I've also had other guest PAs that are ER um, professionals so you can get their insight as well what are some issues that are being faced by PAs currently listen me I'm not the big, the best as far as like current events keeping up with current events because I just be like on the go and having so much to do and I'm just terrible with current events but the only thing I the most recent thing I know I know they're trying to they have a new like president for for AAPA or ARC I don't know. Um, I know, of course, the name change is the newest thing. Uh, I'm just kind of bad with keeping up with stuff. Um, so I'm probably not the best to answer that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. What advice do you have for an applicant to stand out from other applicants? The PA process is very competitive. Yes, the PA process is very, very competitive. I would say the moment to stand out is going to be your essay and the interview. Your essay should highlight your flexes. You know, you don't want to talk so much bad stuff in your essay. You don't want to talk about like, you know, all the classes you failed, all the, you know, stuff you kind of went through, trials and tribulations. If you're going to discuss that and discuss, you know, how you overcame it what you learn from it but your essay is really for me at least in my opinion the essay is reserved for you to flex for you to show off for you to say you know this is why you deserve me to have to have me in your program for you to let them know how you're an asset what you bring to the table so if you really want to stand out I mean even before you write your essay um, write stuff about you you know write stuff make a list of what you like about you or you know things that you know make you amazing and you know kind of so if you have a special talent if you have a blog if you have a YouTube page, if you have anything that you do outside of, you know, healthcare or anything non-healthcare related that kind of makes you stand out. If you did any missions trips, if you, you know, those are the things that I would say to name, you know, in your essay or dimension essay interview to help you stand out. Flex, all about flexing. All right, next question. I hope I'm answering your questions right. Any tips on how to start writing a personal statement? Um, I kind of uh, mentioned about the personal statement. I actually have a lot of resources um, where I give some advice on you know the personal statement writing it you of course um, I can just kind of run through a little bit about the personal statement and what to include the first paragraph should start with your whole paragraph is kind of going to be centered on your why why PA why you chose PA out about all the professions and everything the first paragraph is going to be kind of why you know an introductory why you got into medicine typically or why a pa um usually it's why you got into medicine because usually we know about like healthcare before we know about pa right so it's going to be why you got into medicine 
and you can tell a little story or something, whatever, what your interaction, your first interaction in healthcare interaction with the healthcare provider or doctor, PA, whatever. And then the next paragraph is going to kind of explain and every, it doesn't have to be in this order. You're going to then want to explain why PA. When you explain why PA, you do not want to just say, oh, I want to be a PA because I want to care for someone. I don't want to hear any generic stuff. I want to hear ex- like why PA stands out. If I can, if I can't make out the difference between being a PA and being an MD in your personal statement, then it's not like going to be like doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> okay. So I want to know that your personal statement is really saying why PA? What is, why is PA different from all the other careers? Being a caring provider is not saying why PA is different. You loving patient care, you know, those are all generic stuff. Is it because of the lateral mobility? Is it because um, you'll get to, you know, practice on all these different specialties at once? Is it because you enjoy teamwork and um, being able to collaborate with the supervising physician? Those are kind of things that, you know, make PA different. Okay, so don't be generic in your essay. And then, of course, you want to reserve paragraphs to explain um, more about your shadowing experience, to tell us more about um, your patient care hours, and to tell a patient care experience, patient care hours. And then, of course, to talk about any volunteering work that you do. And volunteering is not just going to be healthcare related. We want to see that you're well rounded, so you can mention non healthcare stuff as well. If you have any interesting hobbies, if you know you're big on YouTube or something like that, you know it's, that's fine to mention. Don't be scared to flex, like I said. And then, of course, you want to conclude. When you write your conclusion, a lot of things I see are people introducing new things in the conclusion. The conclusion is just meant to reiterate and wrap things up, right? So you don't want to mention anything new. You don't want to say, oh, I want to be a PA because of such and such, and you don't talk about this and that. You say, oh, I traveled to the Dominican Republic on a missions trip. You didn't talk about nothing about traveling or nothing about missionary work throughout your whole essay, and then you mention that in the in, in the conclusion. Conclusion. Now you're leaving, uh, you know, areas for interpretation. You're leaving the w- reader wondering, like, okay, what happened at the Dominican? What did you learn from this? Well, how was the missionary trip? You know, if you mention something in the conclusion, make sure it's kind of also mentioned throughout the essay or in the essay somewhere in the paragraphs. If you, you know, if you're big on advocacy, don't say that in the conclusion. Say that somewhere in the essay, and then reiterate in the conclusion and then that's basically it you know the big thing i see students do is mentioning new stuff bringing up new things in the conclusion if you didn't even say anything about you being caring about diversity don't mention that in the conclusion you know so that's one thing and then of course just make sure to keep flexing throughout the essay and especially wrap it up with kind of telling them why you deserve to be in their program and another thing i see is students asking the program oh if you select me or if you pick me for your program or you should choose me no you don't want to ask you want to let them know that you are the bomb right the bomb.com you know you don't want to ever ask nobody we're not we're not begging people right we're going to let them know we're going to show not tell we're going to show them by explaining what you bring to the table rather than by saying oh you know please select me <laughs> no I'm big on showing, not telling. By that, I mean being descriptive. All right, so I just gave y'all a whole synopsis on writing that personal statement. Okay, okay, okay. You guys have any questions? About how many patient care hours did you have? I had over 2,000. Um, if you have, like, questions related to last week's session, I'm not answering, like, any personal questions. If you have those, just email me. How did you get into traveling as a PA? Um, you basically look up for locums tenants gigs. Um, so locums tenant is temporary work, so it's not permanent. So you're not, like, an employee of the hospital. Um, you just kind of go there to fill a spot, fill a need, a temporary need. So it can be anywhere from, it can sometimes, uh, some of them are like a day, um, but you decide what you want to do and how typically you can decide how much time you're willing to commit to that. Uh, so uh, they have different contracts and whatnot, but it's really temporary work and you get into it just by applying for it. You apply, when you apply, you can, um, you, when you go on these job websites or recruitment websites you connect with recruiters you connect with these recruitment agencies they'll they'll be permanent positions temporary moonlighting whatever so for locums it's temporary so you just apply um i recommend that you don't do locums your first year don't do locums right outside of school because you want to have that experience and then for locums they don't really train you like you go in you get like a training of the emr system whatever and then you go they just kind of i felt like that based on my experience kind of just 
they'll probably my first gig did like a little bit of like a few hours of me kind of like following the PA around and kind of seeing how it goes how their flow is but my other one the one that I just did they do nothing like I just jumped right in and started seeing patients and had to figure everything out kind of myself it was kind of terrible so that's why I say if you're new get your feet wet get comfortable with everything with just being a PA first before you do locums I would probably do locums after a year or two of being a PA. What are some direct patient care organization experiences that you have in undergrad? Oh, so you're asking for all three. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see if I remember them. Okay, so patient care. I worked at a nursing home, a skilled nursing facility. That's how I got all my hours. I also worked at a, like, what that was undergrad. And then I graduated college. I was waiting to get into PA school or applying to PA school. And I worked at a, a mental health facility. Like, a um, it was like a, it was an inpatient mental health, like kind of past meds giving the meds that was my patient care and then as far as volunteering i did big brothers big sisters in um college yeah and when i graduated and i did like an internship with them what other volunteering work that i do i don't remember and then uh organizations i was a part of i was a part of a minority association of pre-health students maps it's like a pre-health organization for minorities i was i wasn't really a part of that many organizations <laughs> I was doing what people shouldn't be doing in college sometimes. Let me stop. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't really a part of too many organizations. Um, probably two or three or two. MAPS and I think something else. I was shy and like a little, like I was closed off in college. So I didn't really go out and like, I wasn't really big on campus and stuff. I would go home, do my homework and then kind of leave town. <laughs> I've just kind of always been on the go my whole life. How common is it for PAs to work for DM PR and jobs? Very common. And I say to kind of keep a PR and job on deck just in case you got to leave your job, just in case, you know, people try you <laughs> and you have to go. Um, so you have a PRN job to fall back on. So I've always kind of had a, have I always had a PRN? Yeah, I've always kind of had a PRN job. I had one in, um, or a little kind of part-time type, type of gig. I had one in Florida. And then when I moved to Georgia, my first and second year, I didn't, I, no, I had one towards my second year in Georgia. So I'm going into my third year in Georgia. I moved to Georgia. I mean, no, no, I, I'm in my third year. I'm going into my third year in Atlanta. I'm sorry. Before that was in middle Georgia. So in Atlanta, I've been per diem at the urgent care. And then I, so I pick up shifts in between like uh, traveling gigs. Like when I don't feel like traveling, like I don't feel like doing right now, I pick up shifts. Didn't know I did not have a writing portion of the interview. And I think that's kind of weird to do. Like I want, I would want the interview to be more just talking and getting to know people and, you know, talking to the advisors, talking to the, I mean, talking to the professors, talking to the people who interview, talking to the class, talk, you know, I know it's a little different with virtual, but I would want the interview to be like that, not taking time to write, you know? Okay. So someone asked, how many times did you apply before getting accepted? I, I, I got accepted the first time around, luckily. Um, I, I honestly, didn't know what I was getting myself into <laughs> I kind of just I found out about the PA profession and I applied and I luckily it worked out for me but it could have been bad because I didn't do my due diligence as far as like re researching schools and whatnot I kind of was just like okay I'm gonna just apply to schools that I have the prereqs for and I did um, but I always tell students make sure that the school is accredited and make sure that the school has good pants pass rates like at least 90% of the class passes the pants the first time around and you'll find all that information on the school's website okay can you please talk about your experience of being the only black woman in your pa co cohort this is something i see so often in pa programs and it's a worry of mine yes yeah, so i was the only black female in my physician assistant class i don't know the rate the per i mean the percentage of minorities or um african americans i know it's low in um, pa programs i think a lot of schools need to work towards um di a diverse diversity and diverse programs and, and it should reflect health care you know when you go to the hospital or you go to the ER, or, I mean, you go to the ER hospital, urgent care, wherever you go, family medicine, you know, you see a, a range of patients. They come from all walks of life and healthcare should reflect that. And I don't really think that it does. So my experience was sometimes I felt like out of place. Sometimes I felt, you know, it was a little weird just kind of being an only, you know, and as a minority, when you, you know, kind of go up the career ladder or whatnot, it kind of gets like that. That's just being honest. But, you know, it's, you don't, you can't really blame, of course, your classmates and whatnot, but you just, it's, it's society and, you know, kind of as talking to these programs, making sure that they move towards more diversity. And, um, I, <laughs> it's hard to talk about my experience. <laughs> 
it's hard to talk about my experience. We're gonna we're gonna do an I, IG live if we're gonna do an IG live one day just to really talk about my experience. Um, but it was an experience. It was an experience. Um, it wasn't terrible, but it was an experience. <laughs> So don't be a pick me in your personal statement. Got it. Exactly. Please don't be a pick me. <laughs> so you talk about your GPA in your personal statement. I wouldn't really like if you if you talk about stuff that's in your uh in your application, I wouldn't really talk about your GPA. Like if your GPA is terrible, if you didn't do so well, you can be general about it. If you didn't do so well and it hurt your GPA, you don't have to say, oh, my three point you know, oh, GPA fell to 2.5 or whatever. You can just kind of say, you know, as all do in college, we struggle with adjusting and acclimating, blah, 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 blah. And I had to go through this and I went through this and I'm better and, you know, whatnot. But you don't have to be get into the details, you know. Your essay is to more so, like I said, to flex. Does EMT vo volunteering count as patient care hours? Um, I think usually patient care, they want paid experience. Um, But I would follow up with your school as a non-science major i was a non-science major how can i market myself oh i can see questions okay y'all have a lot of questions and it's almost 7 30 uh as a non-science should i should i do an ig live um one of these days okay if you want me to do an ig live let me know you want me to do an ig live and i'll answer some more questions and i'll talk about my experiences in pa school as a non-science major, how can I market myself as being a great PA? I was a non-science major. I just basically related it to why it would make me a great PA. So I was a sociology major. So I talked about like societal norms and everything I learned in society and how that um, would shape the patient experience with me as a, being a provider. So as a, you can use any majors and relate it back to PA. So that's what you want to do. And that all goes back to flexing and you know showing your skills. With everything that you mentioned, I would kind of talk about why it would make you a great PA. What skill did you attain from this that will make you a, ph a phenomenal physician assistant or PA student? How many PA shadowing hours did you have? I had 60. And mind you, I found out about the PA profession um, fall 2012. I applied to PA school August 2013. So like summer 2013. And then I shadowed July 2013. I shadowed for like six weeks from like July to August. And then I applied to PA school. And I applied to PA school kind of, I, I guess, a little later in the cycle. It wasn't super early. It was August 31st, 2013. Yes, I remember the exact date. And that was the exact same date three years later that I took my pants, August 31st. 2016. Wow, talk about full circle. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's oh, never mind. I'm not gonna go off topic. So um what was the question? Oh, 60 hours. Is housing and traveling costs typically it is included for being a travel PA? Um, and typically they, they pay a little more um because you may be a 1099, which means you pay your own taxes and they'll pay you a little more taxes and uh health insurance. You gotta get all those. There's no benefits, so they'll pay you a little more. Um, and he, they'll also pay you more because you're, you know, a travel provider and it's kind of the inconvenience associated with that. And they'll pay for your housing and travel. The last agency I was with did, but the one prior in New York did not. But they really compensated me for that. How much autonomy do you have as a PA? A lot. I'm just kidding. Okay. So yes, there is a level of autonomy as a PA and it gets easier to be autonomous um and you will be more autonomous as you get more experience um it probably it probably won't be as much once you graduate or within like the first six months of working especially if you work in a certain specialty where you ve work very closely with the doctor such as surgery but as you get more experience you do have a level of autonomy in some some areas some regions some specialties you're completely autonomous like urgent care you're basically completely autonomous you can you have a you don't you won't have a physician on site but you'll have their number to contact them if you need anything and generally generally it's like not really often that you'll need something especially if you're like experienced and comfortable um so that's a specialty and then some family medicine practices you know especially in a rural area you may be the only provider so there's a lot of sole provider practices where it's just you know the pa not an md but an md is readily available and that's the thing you want if an md is not there you just want them to kind of just be available or you know able to contact them i was part of maps too oh my gosh um is there did you go to uf i went to uf undergrad you guys 
or is there maps in other schools volunteer hours in high school i wouldn't use volunteer hours in high school i would talk about college does working in an eye doctor's office count as patient care what did you do at the eye doctor's office what was your role okay i'm gonna answer like two more questions and then i gotta go start to start the uh what you call it i'm trying to like kind of skim through the type of questions i see okay if i don't answer your question just um be part of my life i don't know when but if you follow me on ig then um you'll see when i go live but i see you guys have a lot of questions and i feel bad that i can't answer them in a timely manner okay one more question and if we have more time after the case study then i'll uh answer some more uh thank you guys how was your experience working as a pa through the pandemic y'all y'all don't even want to know that i was i worked from home the, for the majority of the pandemic um okay what is considered the pandemic I, are, we, are we still in a pandemic that's what that's what i mean by what's considered the pandemic because i'm like are we still in a pandemic when did the pandemic end like is it still going on uh so when it started april okay so just a really quick rundown of my experience working in the pandemic and then that's it so I actually, um, in December, I put my three, December 2019, I put my three months notice to quit my job in the ER um, in Georgia, I mean, in Atlanta. And then, so that would would have been March 20, 2020. So that around the time that the pandemic started, I was leaving my job and I was kind of just going to be in the urgent care as I kind of figured my life out. <laughs> so long story, you guys will figure it out later. <laughs> we'll learn about it later. But um so yeah, I I literally left when the pandemic started. I I would I actually didn't leave. I didn't quit. I just um became per diem, and I was still kind of picking up shifts a little bit throughout the pandemic. But I was um I I worked a little bit, and when it started, it was crazy. I like when it the the weekend that things were getting like crazy and shutting down and everything. Um, I worked like a bunch of days straight and i went from seeing it so chaotic like it was super chaotic we didn't know what was going on we didn't know anything about it we didn't know how to treat it really we didn't know like we were kind of just hearing all these rumors and stuff you know as all the stuff that was you know with the chaos and pandemonium that you would see you were seeing on tv ERs were basically the same. People were freaking out. People were wanting to get tested and we're like, um, yeah, we can't test you in the ER. You have to be admitted uh, or you would have had to be admitted. People were scared. Uh, so I, I didn't know nothing about it. I didn't really even know what to tell patients. <laughs> Like I said, I don't keep up with current events. It's so sad. It's so bad. So I thought, I mean, I was hearing about COVID in January. That's when I first heard about it. But I didn't know it really hit the U.S. until like the first week of March when I was seeing patients that had it. And then I had my first encounter with the COVID patient, like right around the time that they shut down the um, the country. So they shut it down. And I did like like a week straight of working in the ER and then it was my last day and then boom and then right after I left I heard it kind of like just became a ghost town you know we we went into uh to quarantine and every the world shut down and the ERs basically basically shut down too they started cutting back hours because there was no patients coming in um I picked up like a shift in between then too and it was weird there weren't too many patients coming in and then I did the urgent care and we literally probably saw like three patients in 12 hours <laughs> no and then and then um the urgent care adopted COVID testing and then it went crazy. It became so busy because everybody wanted to get tested for COVID. Like, so from May up until I started working in New York, it was just COVID testing, COVID testing, COVID testing. There was like no other complaint, no other type of diagnosis or complaint. There was no such thing as heart attacks. There was no such thing as headaches. I mean, unless it was related to COVID, there was no, no such thing as abdominal pain, unless it was related to COVID. There were some injuries because people were home in quarantine and cutting themselves and stuff trying to do like you know um housework you know doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing but basically everything was just covid everybody it was just chaos and so it was just a lot of covid testing and i felt like okay i'm just doing covid testing now that's all it is that's all the urgent care is and then i basically did that from like may to um or april up until like november december i i, I started just seeing patients strictly online um in the fall so i was just doing covid testing i was talking to them kind of screening them and then ordering their covid tests super easy and then I've heard about the New York gig and I went to New York in December and I worked in New York from December to July. And I guess, uh, thankfully, I went there at a good time because COVID started to die down there. So my time in New York, I feel like I probably saw like 30 COVID patients and admitted probably like less than half that, I would say. And I only saw a lot of COVID patients when I was in the COVID area of the hospital. They had like a COVID area and um, 
that's when I would see COVID patients. Um, but it really wasn't that bad as far as COVID complaints in New York. Thankfully, I got there at a, you know, a good time um, for a provider to be there and work, you know, you know, in that type of environment. So I didn't experience, it wasn't too bad as far as my experience. I know some people, you know, they got sick from COVID. I like the ER that I worked at, a PA there died from COVID, unfortunately. They were telling me, I heard horror stories from the staff um, in New York. So yeah, I'm just thankful that I didn't, you know, experience the blunt of it. And it was, you know, that bad. So in New York, it was mainly like regular stuff that I saw along with a bunch of mental illness because it was just that population. Okay. All right. So guys, I'm going to start the presentation. I'm sorry if I didn't answer all your questions. All right. There's maps in other schools. Great. You see? Good question. Eileen, how did you sustain yourself during PA school when you weren't allowed to work? Um, my parents. <laughs> My parents took care of me financially, basically. I took out loans to just to cover school. And if you, you know, you're, if, you know, unfortunately your parents aren't able to really help you financially, you basically have to take out loans and live on loans. Um, I mean, you just, it's just, you just got to do what you got to do. So, yes. But I would say if you can take out the most minimum amount of loans, because remember, you got to pay back and interest rate is no joke. Thankfully, I was also able to pay off my loans because they freeze interest rates. So my loans, um, when COVID started, I owed 66000 and I just paid that off. So, you know, thankfully, they stopped interest rates. So it didn't go from 66 to 86 because it really would have. And I'm not even going to get started on student loans. All right, guys. I just wanted to answer Eileen's question really quick because it was a good question. And it was short. All right. So emergency medicine. A lot of you guys don't know how I do my ER case studies. So we're going to run through that really quick. I'm in ER. or well, Most of my uh, work has been in the ER. So I'm an ERPA, I guess. Okay. So uh, what I tell my students for the ER is always worse first. The emergency room. People come in. Um, they come in sick, uh, and your job is to make sure that whether you discharge them or, um, or no, not even discharge, but your job is to make sure that there's it's a safe disposition. The disposition is, are they going to be discharged? Are they going to be transferred? Are they going to go um, home? And if they do, whatever the disposition is, make sure that it's safe. Make sure that the patient, especially if the patient goes home, make sure that you ruled out i mean you're not going to rule out everything you're not going to a lot of times know what's wrong with them but make sure you rule out the worst thing first you know you you make sure and you document that you know you have low suspicion for this that you know labs that don't indicate this that imaging does not indicate this you know it's going to be a lot of documentation the er is all about covering yourself okay so remember that remember remember the most emergent presentations cases um diagnosis Everything you'll learn that in pay school, emergent diagnosis, emergent complaints, and rule those out as it relates to the patient. Okay, if you do that, you know, for the most part, you should be okay. But always remember, worse first. If I tell you a patient comes in comes in complaining of abdominal of abdominal pain, think about all the things related to abdominal pain that can kill your patient. All the organs in, the, in your abdominal area, even your back, because something a back. I mean, abdominal pain could be related to something going on in your back, right? So, um, or you can have a back pain, but it is it's abdominal pain related. That's what I meant. So. Always think about worse first. Always think about what's going to kill your patient. Think about are they sick? And by sick, I mean, are, are they sick to where they need to be admitted to the hospital, transferred, whatever. Um, think about some pearls. Pearls are like, you know, important tips to know. Um, think about your differential diagnosis. Always consult um, an attending. Attending is your supervising physician or just a doctor uh, and or specialist. So the case study, new arrival. That's just a little topic, whatever, of discussion. Okay, a 33-year-old female presents to the, ER, to, the, to the ER complaining of vaginal bleeding and cramping. How are her vitals looking? I like to be interactive. If you guys don't know, I like to ask questions. Um, if you want to come on to answer questions during the case study, I see people um, wanting to come on. So I let some people come on. If not, we can just go on.
but how are her vitals are they normal are they abnormal good vitals look good so one of the first things you're going to do as the ERPA is you're going to see the chief complaint on the tracker or when you pick up the patient or you're going to see the um yeah you're going to see the patient's name and pick up the patient that's available and then the first thing you're going to do is read the chief complaint or the the, the chief complaint is the what this is the main complaint vaginal bleeding and cramping and you're going to look at the vitals the vitals are very 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 important to look at they're vital they're called vital for a reason the vital signs it's going to tell you give one of the first indications of how your patient is doing so always look at your vitals but from looking at your vitals you're going to be able to tell stable or unstable okay and that'll kind of also give you an idea of how sick the patient is is this going to be something you're always going to be thinking oh is this going to be a patient that's going to be admitted or discharged you're not ever really going to know until the end but it's just going to keep giving you an idea and clues to the puzzle it's like solving a puzzle isn't the bp slightly low the the bp is okay um especially thinking that she's a female females you know especially small females tend to run on the lower end bp's not high bp's fine all right what would what, what would you be thinking what would you want to ask this patient so let's go on so in the er everything's you know you're being going to be seeing a lot of patients at once it's very busy so you're not going to be doing your whole you know full h and p that full h and p you learn in or you're going to learn in PA school H&P means history and physical so that full H&P you're going to learn in PA school forget about it the ER is going to be focused so you're going to be focusing on com um, questions related to the patient's complaint and then your physical is going to be questions related to the complaint as it relates to um, whatever area uh, that you're going to be examining all right what are some important questions you'd want to know so this is the little guide that i gave you guys you want to know past medical history past surgical history family history social history along with the hpi history of present illness basically kind of finding out what's going on you got to investigate right you got to interview them so the first thing you want to know let's see what you guys say a lot of y'all saying pregnancy good job so hi you're going to introduce yourself hi my name is joanna i'm the physician assistant and uh what's going on today so um i'm bleeding and um i'm cramping uh so then you're of course you're going to say you're bleeding okay is this your period you, you know it's I mean, you're bleeding and cramping. It sounds like a period, right? I mean, and when the way I'm talking now, that's not how I'm talking to the patient. I'm just talking to you guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you're bleeding and cramping, right? So the first thing we're probably going to try to think is, okay, may, is this your period? No, um, I think I had my period like two months ago, and then it just came on. This bleeding started. So you haven't had a period in two months? No. Um, did you take a pregnancy test? Um, no, I haven't. Okay, so um, when was your last period? Um, I don't remember the exact date, but I think it was two months ago. Are you on birth control? No. Are you sexually active? Yes. Um, when did the when did the bleeding start? The bleeding started like um, six hours ago. Is it a lot of bleeding? Can you describe it? How many pads are you going through? That's a big question you want to ask about how many pads. That'll give you an idea of the um, amount of bleeding. I'm on my second pad. Okay. And are you clotting? Um, I just saw a little bit of clots. Okay, is it dark blood? Does it look like your period? Does it feel like your period? Um, I don't know. It's just like weird. You know, patients are going to be like that. They're not going to tell you, you know, it's not going to be straightforward. So you just got to ask questions. Okay, um, so we kind of asked, got a rundown on the bleeding. So now let's ask about the cramping. Okay, so tell us about the cramping. When did the cramping start? It started around the same time as the bleeding. Is it really bad? Can you tell us a scale of 1 to 10? It's, it's you know, not bad. It's like a 2. Okay, good. So it's not too bad. Um, so have you taken anything for it? No. Um, is, is it located in anywhere? No, it's kind of just all over. Okay, so it's not a localized pain. Okay. And um, have you ever had pain like this before? It kind of feels like pain that I had in my period. Even remember she said that it doesn't feel like her period, but patients can be like that. <laughs> okay, so it kind of feels like the pain that I had on my period, um, but it's just weird. Okay, so that's fine. Um, any nausea, vomiting? So now you ask like associated symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or you can also ask if it's been a constant pain. Yeah, it's been constant. Any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, just a little nauseous. Any vomiting, no vomiting, no diarrhea, no dark tarry stools no bloody stools no fever any burning when you pee or peeing a lot no any blood in the oh, yeah there's blood in the urine um any back pain no um okay so that's basically how i would do my h and p and that was what less than five minutes i think so boom you did your you did your um history and then move on to the physical 
So you don't want to really be in the patient's room for more than, I mean, sometimes you'll be in there for a while, but more than 10 minutes. Um, I try to keep it because you have a lot of patients you're seeing at once. Sometimes I'll go into work and there'll be like eight patients to pick up and I would pick up like all eight of them sometimes and knock them out. And then I kind of cycle through, do all eight of them, discharge or admit eight and then pick up another eight or whatever it is, or I pick up four and then do what I got to do. And yeah, she is not on birth control, birth control, irregular menstrual cycle. Um, she said that she last had her period two weeks, two months ago. So that's a good question. Um, are your per periods usually abnormal? Um, I don't think so. Is she on any meds that can cause her to bleed? Probably not. Okay. What systems do you want to assess? What system? So when you do her physical, what are you going to, um, like, what are you going to look at? What are you going to look at for her physical guys? Are you going to, uh, check her eyes? abdominal heart lungs good job sarah g u g -U. okay good job good job abdominal pelvic awesome good great job guys heart and lungs awesome okay pelvic exam press on the abdomen perfect so you touch her abdomen she has mild tenderness mild generalized tenderness so basically bowel signs are normal everything else is normal okay what labs do you want to order specifically for this patient what labs do you want to order specifically for this patient and her complaint usually i'll put some of the labs but now i want you guys to tell me good job i see cbc perfect pregnancy ua perfect urine yes hcg test great job um Blood work, what kind of blood work? CBC iron, what do you mean by iron? So for this patient, I would order a CBC, a CMP complete blood count. Um, I mean, CBC is complete blood count. CMP is um, comprehensive metabolic panel. A UA, just a regular urine, UA. Uh, HCG, um, you can do a HCG, HCG, like a pregnancy test. You can either do a, a urine pregnancy, blood pregnancy, quant, qualitative, whatever. It's really easy to just start off with the pregnancy test, um, a urine, because they a lot of times they have that done while they're waiting. Um, they'll have it done in triage. They'll ask for some urine, especially female bleeding, pre uh, belly pain. The first thing you would probably think to, to rule out is pregnancy, right? So a lot of times they'll have that done already or pending before we even they even see the provider. Okay, so I see some BMT pregnancy ads. I would also order a lipase. I order lipase for like all abdominal related complaints, even though it's low suspicion for pancreatitis or any kind of type of liver stuff. I just order lipase. Um, okay, so UAPOC is um, UAPOC pregnancy is positive. So POC means point of care test. If you guys already kind of work in healthcare, you know point of care test is a test that's done kind of in house. You don't send it out to the lab. You just kind of do it right then and there, and you get the results within a few minutes. Um, so UA means urine. Urine point of care pregnancy is positive. What do you want to do next? Elevated immune activity? I don't know what that means. <laughs> so what do you guys want to do next? Her urine pregnancy is positive. What do you want to do next? Okay, good job, Brittany. Um, HCG quant. So, okay. So what I would do next is... Um, I was She's always going to need a pelvic exam just because she's bleeding to check where the bleeding is coming from. So blood typing. So blood typing is very, very, very important. All females... All females that are pregnant and bleeding, don't ever forget to do blood typing, okay? Always check their, whether they're RH positive or RH negative. You will learn this in PA school. It's such a, uh, it's, my, my class had a whole issue with this. Like, we literally argued, well, I didn't argue. I don't argue with nobody. <laughs> but a lot of the students, like, argued with the professor as far as, like, because they didn't understand the RH screening and RH typing and hemolytic um, anemia of the newborn and the risk for that and everything and, so just know it's really, really important to do RH screen. You want if the because you're gonna give Rogam. Well, if the if it's negative, then you would give Rogam. Rogam is a, a shot, a medication to give to kind of prevent that. Um the the mama's blood attacking the fetus's blood or fetus's blood attacking the baby's blood. You know, I don't really remember all the rundown, but or the whole the whole pathophysiology behind that. But do RH screening. If it's positive, if they're if they're RH positive, you're good. If it's RH negative, you're bad, though they will need Rogam. They they typically get Rogam twice in pregnancy, um, like their third trimester. What is it? I forgot the exact time, but they're bleeding, especially if they're RH negative. Okay. So always, 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 always. Even if they're not bleeding, um, and if you notice some blood in their urine, and or um, if you notice blood in their urine, if they've had an MVC, you want to do blood typing. Yes, exactly. Immune response. Exactly, exactly. Hemolytic anemia of the newborn and hemo um, high drops. There's all these levels of it. So good job, guys. Y'all are way smarter than me. <laughs>
Okay, so always remember blood typing. And then the next thing you're going to want to do is a beta HCG if she hasn't, if she didn't already have that done. Remember, you're going to do a regular pregnancy test. The HCG quant quantitative gives you the numerical value. So it'll tell you, kind of give you an idea of where she is in the pregnancy. And then a pelvic exam. For a pel pelvic exam, you don't, you may or may not do the swabs because she's not coming in with STD concern. Um, but the swabs are, you know, and then she'll likely have that done at her first OB appointment. If she wants it to, if you, she wants to do it, you can, or if you see a lot of um, discharge or discharge at all, you can do the swabs, but yes. No, HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin, not human growth hormone. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> okay, so this gives you an idea of um, where the patient is based on their HCG levels. It doubles every like 48 to 72 hours. So we'll get into that later. But yes, so once you get your H once you get your HCG levels, a lot of labs will give you will tell you um give you like a chart like this so you can kind of see exactly where they are or you might have to Google it. <laughs> but yes, so what imaging test does she need and why? A lot of y'all already said it. Um, so she needs an ultrasound. <laughs> so um, and then as far as uh doing the pelvic exam, say you do the pelvic exam, and uh, the the most important thing to check for with the pelvic exam and bleeding is the os. You want to make the the cervix is make sure the cervix is closed. If the cervix is open, it can be a sign of an incomplete abortion or an, 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 an inevitable abortion. Another word for miscarriage is abortion. It doesn't mean that they actually had an abortion where they electively ended the pregnancy, but it's just another word for uh, miscarriage. So uh, yeah, you'll look at the cervix. Most important thing is to make sure that the cervix is closed. Um, you check the amount of bleeding. You check for any like clots, so heavy bleeding clots, anything abnormal. Check for cervical tender. I mean, yeah, cervical motion tenderness or adnexal tenderness. Okay, so you do an ultrasound. You do so the ultrasound, the type of ultrasound you do is going to be based on how far along mom is and the HCG will tell you. So if she's like pretty far like half past the first trimester, then you can do a transabdominal, but usually like the set first 7 8 weeks it'll be like transvaginal or a lot of times yeah, they they can do both. So you do a transvaginal ultrasound and you see this. Bing bing bing. What do you see? Okay, so I try, I try to find this online so you guys can see what the report looks like um because that's what's going to be important the radiologist's um interpretation of the ultrasound so it'll tell you like um how far along mom is six weeks six days for instance and any abnormalities um the important important thing with the ultrasound especially if the patient's just now finding out that they're pregnant is to rule out a what what you want to roll out whoever says this first gets a big 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 surprise i'm just kidding I'm lying to y'all. But what do you want to rule out? What's really, really important to rule out when patients are just now finding out that they're pregnant and they're bleeding and they have cramping? What do you want to rule out? Yes, Zach. Perfect. Perfect. You're so smart. Zach is the first one. He is so smart. It's National Zach Day. So you want to rule out an ectopic. It's really important to do an ultrasound when they're first coming in and they're having some cramping, even if their HCG is super low and it's like, oh, it's too low to even be an ectopic or whatever. I just cover myself and I do an ultrasound just to make sure that fetus is not growing anywhere else or the, you know, nothing is going on anywhere else. But <laughs> here's the caveat. Caveat. <laughs> A lot of times the ultrasound will be like inconclusive for an ectopic. If there's definitely an ectopic, it'll say that there is. But if they're not sure, it'll be like, oh, ectopic pregnancy cannot be rolled out. So what does that mean? <laughs> Um, so that means that you can you can get um, OB on board and OB will examine or OB will do their own kind of um, ultrasound. You know, they're better at it. They're really good at it. OB will examine. Um, and then or, um, and then you definitely, definitely, definitely tell the patient to come back in. If the ultrasound is inconclusive for anything, if they doesn't see a baby, I, I, if you see a baby, if it's in the uterus and you know that, you know, likely that it's not an ectopic unless it's like twins or something or something crazy going on. But if it says that there's an intrauterine gestation, then you know that likely it's not. But if it's not showing anything, then you get OB involved and it says basically you know it cannot rule out ectopic I hate seeing that I hate reading that and you'll see that all the time because they they like to they you know it's, it's really hard to definitely say 
this is not this is definitely not going on and this is definitely going on right and in in um medicine you never want to like using the word definitely is like just i would never use it in medicine because people you know it's it's hard to say that this is not for sure going on because you know you don't really know the human body you know so if the pregnancy test is negative then it's not a topic <laughs> yes yeah, so i is so they never say definitely or you know no way it is so it's going to be always kind of be inconclusive sometimes if there's no gestation so what you do you can get ob you can consult ob and then ob will say oh or you can tell the patient to come back and ob will say this too in 48 to 72 hours and why do we say that because that's when the hormone level should be doubling remember i said hormone levels double every 48 to 72 hours and if that's happening then that's likely you know the pregnancy's uh you know a pregnancy you know that's it's continuing if it's dropping if it's not or if it's going up abnormally or something looks weird or whatever the patient comes back you can do a repeat ultrasound you do a repeat hormone levels and um, go from there and kind of determine if it really is an ectopic going on or the patient might have to even come back again or if it's um, a miscarriage and uh, yeah so you want to rule out an ectopic right right Janelle you have to keep checking HCG levels right right perfect okay and a lot of times the ultrasound may show a subchorionic hemorrhage that can be a, a common sign of bleeding, a common cause of bleeding in, um, in pregnancy. And basically you're bleeding from the membranes um, or you can also bleed during implantation. Um, so those that just that's, you know, can be normal. I mean, that can, you know, just be it doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're going to have a miscarriage. And and I'll tell you guys, talking to moms um is you have to be very, very mindful of your words and how you talk to moms that are either pregnant and they know they're pregnant and they're bleeding or they're pregnant and they're just finding out that they're pregnant and they're bleeding because it's a tough situation. It's a tough moment. They are gonna have, they're going to be very anxious. So just be very mindful with your words. Don't use the word definitely. Don't use the word, you know, be mindful of your words, like I said. Okay. Oh, I forgot to put um, subchorionic hemorrhage on here, but that's another um, differential diagnosis. So, um, threatened miscarriage, miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, premature rupture of membranes, placenta previa, abrupt placenta, UTI can cause a little bleeding, but of course, <laughs> I mean, they'll have a UTI, but um, uh, what else? Trauma can cause bleeding in pregnancy, especially after MVCs. Remember I said if the patient had an MVC and you notice, um, do a UA and you notice blood, do, um, do a blood count, I mean, do a RH screening. Um, and then subchorionic hemorrhage, I forgot to put. Yes. Yeah, so as I was saying, be very careful how you talk to mom. You don't want to say that this is for sure what's going on. This is for sure what's not going on, especially if you don't know if it's like a, a, a miscarriage, especially if there's no heartbeat, especially if there's no this, no that. I've had friends tell me that, you know, they went to the ER and the doctor said, and, or not, I'm not going to say doctor, the provider, whoever the provider was, would say that, oh, um, there's no heartbeat at all. You'll likely need a DNC. I don't, I would never ever tell a patient that they need a DNC. That's not my place to tell a patient. You know, a DNC is dilation and curatage, or you have dilation and evacuation, basically means to end the, a way to end the pregnancy. So it's, that's a, you know, they, it's a procedure to end the pregnancy. Uh, when the patient's having a miscarriage and it's like an incomplete, it's not, you know, the, there's still retention of, uh, products of conception um but yeah so you you don't ever tell patients that you leave all that to ob leave all that to the experts okay so you just kind of explain to them exactly what's going on exactly the results and i like to print out stuff for the patient i like to print out their ultrasound results so they see for themselves or i'll, I'll write down their hormone levels i'll write down you know what's going on i'll you know write down notes for them i'll say okay this is what your hormone level is today when you come back in a 48 to 72 hours this is what you know it should be um you know rising you know doubling it should have doubled so we'll see what it is um and yeah so you kind of just explain that to them and no don't ever say anything that's you know a end all be all because pregnant and bleeding in the first trimester um can be it happens it doesn't mean that they're going to have a miscarriage it never ever means that it's going to be a miscarriage for sure like I said, a lot of times it continues. There could be a lot of things causing it. You kind of explain that to mom and you just be very supportive. And if it is, if they do come back and their levels fall, 
which is sad, which is bad, um, then you explain to them that it means that they're likely miscarrying. And I would tell the patient that it means that, you know, it's not a good sign. It's likely that, you know, um, that the, the hormones are not, you know, it's not, it's, it's so hard to explain that, you know, it's so hard to tell mom that, you know, the baby's not going to, you know, the pregnancy is not going to continue. So yeah, you say it likely means that the pregnancy will not continue. And, you know, I advise you to get some rest, you know, if they need Rogam, you give Rogam um, rest, you know, stay hydrated. You know, I say, you know, who do you, you know, I, I say, do, you know, support system and make sure to follow up with OB or, I, you know, I can I'll, if they haven't already given them OB, get OB consult and whatnot. So Yes, it's unfortunate, but yes. Okay, so when to safely discharge? All right, no ectopic. If there's no ectopic going on, they can be discharged. And like I said, it's going to be inconclusive. It's inconclusive, then you make sure you kind of consult OB or tell a patient to come back in 48 to 72 hours. Um, even if there was an ectopic, a lot of, you know, they can, be, uh, the only time the, the, uh, well, the OB will let the, you know, if they can be discharged with an ectopic, OB will make that decision. Um, if it's a ruptured ectopic, they ain't going nowhere. They go into the OR. <laughs> if is it, it is an ectopic. And I think depending on the size and whatnot, like all these factors, um, they can give them a medicine called met, um, methotrexate or they may do surgery. But like I said, that's up to OB to decide. And then labs and ultrasound with the normal limits are stable. No Nothing's crazy going on in the ultrasound. If they have a subchorionic hemorrhage, that's fine as long as it's not huge or nothing. Um, then they can go home. Labs, if the labs are fine, then they can go home. Um, like I said, cleared by OB. If you consult OB, make sure that you know OB writes a note and that it aligns with your findings. Um, and I, like I said, return for a repeat HCG and ultrasound if if it's inconclusive. Um, always advise OB follow up. Alrighty, any questions? I think that's the end. So I always say to know what's common. Um, no zebras. Zebras are things that you'll never see. I don't, uh, you'll probably never see in your whole career, but it's really bad. Um, they're bad diagnoses. And if you see them, you got to at least remember something about them. And I always say necrotizing fasciitis because I hope I never see that in my entire career or I hope I never miss it. <laughs> no one can kill you, which is kind of similar to zebras, but you can see common stuff too or stuff are more common than zebras. They're not necessarily zebras, like heart attacks can kill you and it's not a zebra. Um, so, oh, yes. And document, 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 document. With everything, document. Are patients typically assigned to you in the ER? Do you see patients depending on the complexity of the case? Okay, so um, the, they'll assign patients to different pods of the ER. So there's a lot of times ERs will have a main area and then an area for like lesser acuity patients where the, um, the they'll call us mid-levels or APCs, it's um, um, advanced practice clinician or APP, advanced practice provider, that's what we're called. They'll put patients like on our side that are less... Um, you know, less sick, like levels, levels three, four, five, sometimes level twos. Sometimes, you know, they don't triage as they should, as well as they should. And we still see level twos or high acuity level twos. But yeah, so they'll put them on our side and then we kind of just pick up patients or they'll, they'll put them to, uh, to wherever, like, you know, our assignment is. And we just pick up whatever patients that that's, you know, waiting to be seen. So it's not necessarily patients assigned to me specifically, but patients in my pod. And yeah, it'll be depending on the complexity of the case, the um, ASI ESI level. <laughs> I said ASI. Um, yes. Alrighty, you guys. Any more questions? I think I, I think that's it. My contact info for y'all. Did you, any questions about this? Was I did I talk fast? Let me know if I talk fast. I feel like I tend to talk fast. How you like? How did you guys like the case study? Did you feel like you learned? <laughs> Great. Thank you. And make sure you follow me on IG because that's where I'll likely go live. Maybe I'll go live Friday. Um, I probably won't be doing, doing nothing with my life. So maybe I'll go live then. Great job, guys. Great job. Thank you. Yes, I see myself training specialties. <laughs> yes, I'm like about done with the ER. <laughs> yes, go live on IG. Okay, I'm gonna go live on IG Friday. I'll post something about it. I'm sorry, guys. I'm glad you're learning. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it and are learning. So uh, make sure to follow me on IG. I'll go live and I'll be able, be able to answer all your questions. It won't be just one hour. Usually I'm on live for hours because I be joking with y'all. So my lives are fun. <laughs> so um, good night, everybody. 
Have a great night. Have a great week. See you guys maybe Friday. All right. Peace.